right. Well, good morning, church. What a great place to be. Come on, man. I'm so excited. Isn't it cool to see that encounters happening? That's right. You there in the back. Do you know when the last time we did encounter in church was? October 2019. It's been two years since we've had encounter in the church. We had one online encounter last year. Online's great. It's not quite the same, but it's great, and we're grateful to God for it. But it's been two years since we've had an encounter in this church. If you haven't been here uh, in the last two years, you would have missed that. It is a phenomenal time. It is a one-hour time of just coming together and worshiping. And let's be honest, most of you just come for the worship in the beginning of the service. And then you've got to sit through me as well. That's kind of what you have to deal with because you came here for the worship. There's worship and it's an hour. There's no preaching. There's no message. There is just an awesome time of connecting in God's presence. There is kids care because we're trying to eliminate as many excuses as we can. Come on, give me another excuse. School's so hectic now. Just get here tonight. Six to seven, kids care. It's going to be amazing. And uh, we're going to worship God. And let me, let me say this. Bring a notebook and a Bible. Sometimes we come and we just want to worship God, and that's great. But sometimes God wants to speak to us. It'd be good to have something to write down what he says to you. And sometimes he just, he just I, I've had this many times when I'm worshiping and I just want to flick through my Bible and I catch a highlighted part and it's for me in that moment. It's that rhema word that God sometimes just gives. And so bring your Bible, bring a notebook, come along and just have a lot of fun tonight. The worship team really, the back and front, just did an absolutely exceptional job this morning. And uh, yeah, just can we thank them? I mean, we, we can do that. We know that God does His thing, but it's so nice when you've got skilled people doing their thing. You know, when, when people's skills mix with God's supernatural way, it just makes something amazing happen. And so I was really, really blessed uh, by this morning, even though it wasn't for me. It was for God. But I really, really enjoyed it. You ready for the message today? Was anyone here last week? Stick up your hand. Just let me, Okay, cool. There were a couple of oaks who were here last week, which is fantastic. I think... Last week was amazing. Something's changed in church, and I don't know what it is. And that's unsettling. If anyone should know what it is, it should be me. And I don't know what it is. But there's a responsiveness, there's an openness, there's a softness. I see a lot of people nodding their heads because you felt that. There's just something different, but it's amazing, it's good, and we trust God that He is doing something. And this is a series which you might think is a little bit strange. It's called Sunday School Stories You Got Wrong. It's called that because some of us were dragged to Sunday school when we were younger. Some of us are traumatized. No, we're not. <laughs> Actually, I'm grateful that I was dragged to Sunday school as a young person because I didn't realize it then, but it was putting foundations into me that I now go, oh, okay, of, of course I know those stories. Of course I know what God did. Of course I know what God said. And of course I know where people failed and where I can maybe do better. Those are spiritual foundations that were put into me through Sunday school or kids' church as we call it now. I don't think I loved it at the time, but I'm grateful for it now. At Sunday school, we were taught all the cool stories. We were taught all the most well-known ones, stories like Adam and Eve, David and Goliath, Jonah and the whale, Daniel in the lion's den. And what I've come to realize over the years since I've been in Sunday school is that sometimes we can come out of kids' church, we can come out of Sunday school, and we can know the story pretty well, but sometimes we actually learned the wrong lessons. Sometimes we come away and we know Daniel in the lion's den, and it paints a picture of God in our minds. And then we hear a story about Jonah and the whale, and it paints a picture of God in our minds. And we grow up with these little pictures of God, and we put together our image of God. And very often, it's not true, and it's not accurate. And it's no one's fault. It's not the Sunday school teacher's fault. It's not our dad's fault. It's not, it's just the way that it sometimes is. We put the pictures together and we form something that isn't actually accurate. And that's really the point of this series, to find faulty ways of seeing God that we've learned and to correct them. 
And so there's one key that I shared last week, and I'm just kind of going over this quickly because this key is critical. In fact, this key you could write down in your Bible. This would be a worthwhile one to take your phone out and get a photo of. You can scribble this in the back of your Bible because it will always be helpful. It's not just a, a phrase that I'm going to share for this series. It's the key to understanding, actually, the stories from the Bible. Here it is. Every Bible story has an ancient meaning as well as a timeless message. If you understand that, you're not going to be shaken when stories don't make sense to you. You're not going to be sucked in when you see awesome posts on Facebook that declare this about God and you go, but there's something wrong with this, but I don't know what. It's because people have confused the timeless message with the ancient meaning. And so I'm going to explain that in a second, but every Bible story has an ancient meaning and a timeless message. Every Bible, this is what it means, an ancient meaning is what the human author was saying to his or her original readers. It's the ancient meaning. It's the facts as they were reported or recorded. That's the ancient meaning. The timeless message is what God is saying to us here and now through the Scriptures. And so that we can take out of a story like we looked at last week when we looked at David and Goliath. Do you remember that story? And how people can, can take all sorts of funny things out of that story about this, the five smooth stones. And you go, that's... You, you, you're just reading that into the story. And sometimes people want to make a whole message about that. And actually, that's not the timeless message. That's just part of the ancient meaning. It's just David who picked up five smooth stones. No one said there was spiritual significance to the five smooth stones. But we can misread it. And so this is a really important thing. If you want to get Sunday school stories and every other story right, and so last week I looked at those examples very quickly, David and Goliath, Daniel and the lions, then if you missed it, I think it was a good intro message to this, and so you can always catch that on our YouTube channel. Can I pray, and then we're going to get into some new stuff. Father God, I pray for soft and open hearts right now. Father God, I pray that where we have seen you wrong, where we have understood your character and your nature incorrectly, God, would you help us? God, would you set things right? Would you rewire the way that we see you so that it is more true and more correct? Help us, Lord, to be soft and humble enough to see where we don't see you truly as you are. And help us to be willing to allow you to change that picture. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today's part two. So I don't know if you've guessed who I'm speaking about, I'm quite a chronological guy. That should give you a clue. <laughs> okay, so I'm starting at the very beginning. Today, I'm looking at the story of Adam and Eve. You know the story. Anyone heard of them? Just a little couple who enjoyed a honeymoon in the garden. You remember them? Okay, I just want to make sure that you were also dragged to Sunday school. It's not fair that I was the only one. I love you, mom and dad. Thank you for doing it. I don't know if anyone else experienced that. But they were the mother and father of humankind, created pure and sinless and placed in the beautiful Garden of Eden. We don't know how long they lived in that garden before the fall. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. This is totally aside. Have you thought about that? It's hundreds of years, thousands of years, millions of years with dinosaurs. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. <laughs> So we don't know, we don't speculate, but who knows how long they lived before the fall. That's actually not that important. What is important is that there was a, a day. There was a dreadful day that everything changed. So here are the parts of the story you should have got from Sunday school. God created Adam and Eve. He placed them in the Garden of Eden. Everyone's got that part of the Sunday school story, I'm sure. Then there were two special trees in the garden. You remember this from the story? Some of you go, two? Nah, it was just one. If you've done the freedom course, you know there were two. There was a tree of life, and there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Those were the only two special trees that are mentioned, and one they could freely eat from, and one which was the only thing that was forbidden for them was to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Of course, we know that Satan, in the form of a serpent, lied to Eve and tempted her to eat from the forbidden tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then Eve tempted Adam to also have some. Don't read into that. <laughs> that it was the woman first. Don't read into it. That's not the timeless message. That's just the ancient uh, meaning. She got tempted, then she tempted Adam. They both ate. They both fell. God found them. This is the, another part of the story. God found them and punished them severely in a couple of ways. From that point on, they would start to age and eventually die of old age. Woman's pain in childbirth would increase. Farming the land would become much harder for men than it had been previously. And they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Everyone with me so far? You got the same story from Sunday school, right? Okay. Here's the worst of all part, and it's the last part of the story. Their close friendship with God was broken. Sin had now entered the DNA of humanity and created a gap or a rift between us and God that we couldn't close. That's the story of Adam and Eve. That's what you should have heard. Those are the same points you remember in the story, right? Nod your head. I can't tell with your mask on. That's what I, I need to know, that you got these things. And there's nothing wrong with what I've said so far. All these things actually happened. They're the clear ancient meaning. This is what the original author was trying to communicate and tell the original readers. He was teaching them about the fall. Here's where things get a little bit blurry, though. Let's take a look at the Sunday school lessons, the proper ones, the timeless truths, or actually, let's look at the timeless truths we were taught from this story. See if this rings a bell with you. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sinned. God hates sin, so he punished them. If God punished Adam and Eve for sinning, God will punish us too when we sin. Those were the Sunday school truths, and I can tell you this very honestly. This week, I went onto a couple of kids' church websites to look at Bible stories for kids, and I looked up Adam and Eve, and I can tell you now that that's the story, that's the takeaway from the story of Adam and Eve. We sinned. God punished us. Obey God. And I think there's a problem with that. I think there's a fundamental problem with the way that that helps our minds to see and to understand God. The lessons are all true. Yes, we did sin. Yes, God does hate sin. Yes, God did punish them. The lessons are true, but are they really the best timeless message to get out of the story? Are these messages gonna form a healthy view of God? Or are they gonna give you the idea that God is angry and waiting to punish you? What I can tell you from experience is that sadly, this way of seeing God is very common, not amongst kids or teens, but adults. Maybe it's the way you view God as well. I want you to think about that for a moment, just for a second now. If I had to sit down in a room with just you and I had to ask you to close your eyes and think of God, picture him. What would he be doing? What would he be saying to you? What would the expression be on his face? I know this sounds kind of touchy-feely, but this is actually really important because every single one of us have got a picture of God in our mind's eye. And that picture of God determines almost everything about our spiritual walk. It's that important. It affects how we pray. It affects how we parent. It affects our attitude towards other people. It affects how we react or respond when we mess up and fall and sin. Our view of God affects our whole life. And the well-known preacher, you might have heard of Charles Spurgeon. He was called the Prince of Preachers. He said this, and I completely agree with it. The way you view God will eventually show up in the way you live your life. Your picture of God is absolutely critical. So how do you view God? 
I would argue that the story of Adam and Eve has given many millions of people an unhealthy view of God that has stuck with them throughout their adult lives. It's given them a picture of a God who is angry and waiting to punish, an unfair God who puts temptation right in front of them and then gets angry when they give in to that temptation. That's an unfair God. It gives a picture of a God who's waiting for them to make a mistake so that he can punish them. Can anyone relate to seeing God like this? I know this is kind of uncomfortable to admit. I will freely admit to you that for many years of my Christian walk, if I, to be honest, I saw God like this. If I messed up, I felt, what's God gonna do? What's he gonna say? How much do I need to say sorry before he takes me back, before he accepts me? Because, and, and, and it's shaped from this way of seeing God, that he's angry and that he's actually quite eager to punish us. Because these are the lessons we can sometimes get from a story like Adam and Eve. Almost as if he just put the tree there and then he was like, watch this, guys. Give it time. And then when they mess up, told you so, let's go get them. Isn't it weird? I mean, it sounds funny, but actually a lot of us think like that, like God is literally waiting, hey, for us to mess up. And he's so angry that like coming back to him is so difficult. Some of us parent like that. It affects everything. Well, today I wanna to offer you a different timeless message from this story. And this is the part where and it's interesting just what's come out in the service today already, just about like the way that God sees you and what Saza said and in the worship and in the songs that we've sung. I wanna offer you a different timeless message from the story. One that's gonna give you, I believe, a richer and a healthier view of God. Does that sound good? Okay, maybe you say, I never saw God like that. I think that it's quite deep and quite subtle in a lot of people. I'm not saying that you do, but I'm saying it's worth thinking about. So, you remember the Sunday school lessons that we learned, the one that maybe, they're, they're right, but in the wrong place. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sinned. God hates sin, so he punished them. Well, it's true, but it's not where the lesson should start. Here's where it should start, and you can feel free to write this down. Before there was rebellion, there was relationship. If you get that, your whole picture of God will change. Before there was rebellion, before there was sin, before there was a fall, there was a relationship. Before relationship needed fixing, there was relationship that was broken, but there was relationship. That is the starting point. Every single human being was created for friendship with God first. Think about that. People were not created for hell. Hell was created for the devil. People were created for relationship and friendship with God. That's, that is literally why we were created. That includes you. It includes your unsaved brother. It includes your wayward child. It includes your unsaved colleague and friend. Every single person was created for relationship, for friendship with God. We didn't start off lost. That's not the beginning of the story. We were found before we were lost. And this is a huge deal because the story of Adam and Eve doesn't start with them sinning. It starts with Adam and Eve and their friendship with God. Why is that so important? Well, because when you realize that, when you realize that first and foremost, God created all of us for friendship with him, you realize then what the Bible really is. You realize that the Bible is the story about how God made that friendship possible again. That's the entire Bible. We fall in chapter three and the whole rest of it is God saying, okay, we were in relationship, how do we get back there? The Bible happens. That's what it is. It's God's story of coming back into friendship with him. Listen to this part of the story. 
that happened right after they sinned. Maybe you'll hear something you haven't heard before. It comes from Genesis 3, which is where you find the story, uh, verse 8 and 9. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound. This is right after they've bitten the famous apple. We obviously don't know what kind of fruit it was, but then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Where are you? Do you think maybe God had lost them for a moment? Do you think maybe there was like a little blind spot and God couldn't see them, didn't know exactly where they were? I think God knew exactly where they were and I think God knew exactly what had happened. But did you catch this part of the story? His prized creations, the pinnacle of everything God had created, human beings, had just sinned for the first time. Something that would send the entire human race into a downward sin spiral. And God knew that. And what did he do? God came looking for them. Think about that. He wasn't waiting there with his massive stick. God came looking. The Bible says that God is seeking sinful man still. Not to condemn them or destroy them, which was well within his rights and he could have easily done that. Not to do those things. God is in love with sinful man. I mean, how unbelievable is this? Because before there was rebellion, there was friendship. In fact, Jesus used those words. He said, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. Isn't that a lot like God? There he comes. They've just sinned. They've just fallen. And God comes and he looks for them. And Jesus said, that's why he's there. I've come to seek and to save the lost. I'm looking. Come, where are you? God came looking for Adam and Eve, and God came looking for you and me too. A story that Jesus told, he told the story once, and it, for me, it just drives the timeless message home in the best possible way. It's the story of the prodigal son. And Jesus, you need to remember this, was speaking to religious people who had gotten the completely wrong view of God. They could have been in our Sunday school lessons getting the same thing. And, and he was speaking to what they would have called Pharisees, teachers of the law, religious leaders. He was speaking to them and they were so, how can you eat and drink with sinners? How can you party with them? How can you hang out with them? And Jesus said, I didn't come for the, for the healthy, I came for the sick. And then he told them three stories about things that were lost. You know, the sheep and the coin and the, the son. But what had happened is these guys had gotten completely the wrong idea of God. God was angry. God was looking to punish. And Jesus wanted to set them straight. Can I read this story to you really quickly? To me, it's one of the most powerful parables or stories in the entire Bible. But I want to read it to you really quickly, just so that because this actually drives the timeless message of Adam and Eve home. Let me read this to you, and maybe you're going to see this. It comes from Luke 15, verse 11 to 24. It says, to illustrate the point further, so this is after his stories about other lost things, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'm gonna go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his fingers 
and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. That is a very powerful story. And the whole reason that Jesus told it is that we could understand what God is truly like. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't see an angry father in the story. I just don't see it. I don't see a father that's waiting to punish. I don't see a father that's waiting at the gate with a scowl on his face and a stick in his hand. I don't see that in the story. If anyone knows what God the Father is like, surely it's God the Son. And he says, that's not how God is. You've got this all wrong. Before there was rebellion, there was friendship. Before there was rebellion, there was relationship. Can you see that the Son didn't come from nowhere? He was in the family. He left. He came back. And was God upset? Was God condemning? God was accepting, he was waiting, he was embracing, he was merciful, he showed grace and love. The son was part of the family before he chose to leave the father. Man, and when he, was, when he came home, the father was more interested in forgiving him and restoring him than he was in condemning and punishing him. Well, that's how God really is. And that's the big timeless message from today's Sunday School story. Listen to it. Let me put it in a nutshell quickly. It's not going to come up behind me. Adam and Eve's story doesn't start with them disobeying God and sinning, and neither does ours. It starts with a loving God who created us to be in relationship with Him. Let that be the thing that affects the picture of God that you have in your mind. Because I think that's great news for us who have put our faith in Jesus. And I think it's really great news for you if you haven't done that yet because you can. And as I said, God created us for friendship with him. But our sin has made that friendship impossible. Unfortunately, it did create a gap that we couldn't bridge. It created a chasm we just couldn't cross. We couldn't jump over. We could never get back into that relationship. You know why we could never? People don't understand this. They think, well, a loving God, how can, he be, how can he be so against sin? God is just. We talk about God's love and his grace and his mercy, but God is also just. How many of you would trust the judge in our system if he let everyone who did wrong things go free because he's so gracious and merciful? How many of you would respect that judge? Because there's justice as well, isn't there? So you do something wrong, you do the crime, you do the time. That's justice. Were Adam and Eve punished? They were, because God is just. He cannot be in the presence of sin. So this creates a bit of a situation now because he's created us for friendship, but he can't be in the presence of sin and we are sinful. What now? Well, like Adam, the punishment for our sin is death, but that's not what God wants. So Jesus offered to die in our place, to take the full weight of God's judgment and his anger all on himself so we could be spared. And you know what? The Bible says that believing that Jesus did that for you that is the only way back into relationship with God. That's it. Pointless blaming Adam and Eve. Pointless pointing a finger. How many of us have sinned this week just out of interest? I can tell you now, 100% of the people who were in the Garden of Evil, Eden. <laughs> would have made the same thing. I know I would have. I know it, it's, 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 it's just how it is. So you say, well, why did he put the tree there? Because love isn't love if it's not a choice. It's not love anymore. Love is only love if it's a choice. Love is only love if you can choose not to love. Otherwise, it's a command. Otherwise, you're a robot. And God, if he wanted to create robots, certainly could have done that. But he didn't want that. Robots don't give you relationship. They're trying, and they will keep trying. 
is you can't get relationship from robots. God created us and he gave us choice. And unfortunately, <laughs> Adam and Eve made the wrong one. So would we. I've got no question and no doubt about that. And that separated us, but God has made a way for us to be back with him. Isn't that good news? You've got to start with the friendship. You've got to start with the relationship, not with the sin. And we come back to that. And this is what the Bible says about the, the Jesus being the only way. He says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So he tries to make it, I wanna say as easy as possible from our side. It wasn't as easy as possible from his side. I can't imagine giving up the glory and riches of heaven to be born as an infant who needs to be potty trained, who's born poor, who's born in a stable, who grows up misunderstood, who gets punished and killed. It, it wasn't easy for him, but it's as if he's making it as easy as possible for us. He says, I've done everything you need. Everything, I've done it. I've made the fix here. But here's what you need to do. Declare that Jesus is Lord. Understand that I died for you. Believe in your heart that I raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. That's it. But what about living a good life? Don't worry, that comes afterwards. But what about stopping those habits that I just, ugh, don't worry about it. Just Declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then a few verses later, he re-emphasizes that, Paul. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because God isn't looking to disqualify and punish people. Can you see that? He's not looking to go, mm, you didn't sound very sincere. I'll wait for you to sound more serious. No, no. He's so eager to be back in relationship with us. And that's good news. You can have friendship with God. He's not angry at you. He loves you. Trust him today if you haven't put your trust in him. Today's as good a day as any. Come home to the father like that son. And I promise you, you're not gonna find God waiting angry. You're gonna find God waiting eagerly, ready to party. If you don't know Jesus as your savior right now, you can. And tonight will be a completely different experience for you. I can promise you that. Can we pray? In fact, if you can close your eyes, bow your heads, because I wanna give people a chance here because we're speaking about massive things, beautiful things, wonderful things. That God has made a way, that God has created us for friendship and he's made the way back to himself. And if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior, as your Lord, can I ask you to do something? Maybe you're online, maybe you're here. Can I ask you just to, wherever you are, just raise your hand. Just put your hand up and if today you say, I want to, I wanna know Jesus as my savior. God bless you, thank you. Anyone else today here? God bless you. There's a couple of hands here and there, but this is a really, really big deal. Maybe you've got that distorted view of God that he's waiting to punish you. Today you've realized God loves you and he's made a way for you. I'm gonna ask you to do something and let's all do this together. I'm gonna ask that you pray this prayer after me and, and the magic, you know, the, the prayer isn't magic. What God is looking for is hearts that are open to him, that's all. And so I can lead you in a prayer with some words and if this is the cry of your heart, I promise you that God hears you, he sees that and he is so ready to welcome you home. Let's pray this out loud together. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and making a way for me to come to God. I receive this gift now and I ask you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I give you all of me and ask you to turn my life around for your glory. Fill me with your spirit and help me live the life you died to give me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we just give God glory and just thank him? 
I want to encourage you to do something if you prayed that prayer for the first time. And maybe some of you are more like the prodigal son in that you've been in relationship with God and you've kind of wandered away and you're saying it's time to come home. You know, the Bible uses a great phrase, when he came to his senses. And maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and you've come to your senses this morning. Maybe you're online and you've come to your senses. Can I, there's something we find very difficult to do in this church. And I think it's, I'm assuming it's in all churches. Is we want to, we want to walk with you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you in this journey. And so it's so tough. Sometimes people say, yes, I want to make that decision. And we can't tell who they are. And we go, man, I wish I could pray for them. I wish we could send them a text and see how things are going on this new faith journey of theirs. And we don't know how to do that. And so what we've done is we've made a next steps card. And on the bottom of it, it's in front of all of you. It'll say, I'm committing my life to Christ or I'm renewing my commitment to Christ. Take a moment. You can complete that. You can put it in the drop boxes on the way out. We'll explain that in a second. But that'll help us to know, okay, this is someone who needs us to make contact with them. And there's one more thing that I'm going to ask you to do, but you need to be in the building to be able to do that. And that is, we would love to pray for you after the service. For us, we consider that honestly an honor and a privilege to be able to do that. And so if you've made a decision to put your faith in Christ or you have another prayer need, after the service, when everyone goes and we all, there's some people that are here, I'll stick around this morning. We would love to pray with you and just to start you on that journey. Is that okay? So we want to do that. We don't just want people, yeah, and then they disappear and we never hear again. We want to follow up. We're going to take two minutes really quickly to process this message now. We call it our holy moment. If you haven't been in church for a while, that's what it's called. It's a holy moment. Holy, that word just means set apart. It's a little bit. It's two minutes. 120 seconds that we set up. Yeah. Yeah, that is right. 120 seconds. We set it apart just to take one truth from this message and make it real for you. And so I know maybe you realize that your picture of God needs to change. You've seen him as angry and eager to punish you. Maybe something's happened there. Maybe you're like the prodigal son who wandered away. Whatever, whatever the thing is that impacted you most today, share that with the person next to you. And then straight after these two minutes, we're going to close off the service. All right, let's do that. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you, Father, that our view of you, Lord, you can set it right. Lord, I pray for those of us who, who kind of, um, our default is to think you're going to punish us or you're against me 
or why has this happened? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would keep reminding us that instead we should be turning to you and asking you to help us, thanking you for being with us. Lord, we know that you are a loving Father. We know, Lord Jesus, that, that you embrace us. And we know too that life happens and just because you embrace us, it doesn't mean that, that everything's gonna go smoothly and easily. We know that. We know that hardship happens. We know that suffering happens. But Lord, our friendship with you, that's constant. That doesn't change. And that's because of you, not because of us. And so I thank you so much for that, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen.